Hello everyone, and welcome to this new gen webinar entitled Amplifying the Future of Vaccine Development with SARNA. This webinar was made possible through sponsorship from Precision Nanosystems. I'll be your host for today's event. I'm Jeff Bogaliskis, Technical Editor for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News, which has been at the vanguard of the life sciences industry for the last 40 years, bringing you the latest information on the newest tools and technologies. Now, the more information and data that's uncovered with respect to RNA-based therapeutics, the more the scientific community is impressed with their results. Advantageous qualities like rapid production speeds and efficacious outcomes highlight the need for such therapies in today's market. However, while conventional mRNA strategies have been setting the life sciences industry aflame with possibilities, new and unique self-amplifying RNA lipid nanoparticles are emerging as important therapeutic candidate molecules, especially as it pertains to vaccine development for various infectious diseases. Now, for instance, a recent clinical trial showed data that an SARNA vaccine for COVID-19 was as effective as current mRNA vaccines, yet it required a significantly lower dosage, resulting in numerous therapeutic and manufacturing advantages. These advantages are something our guest presenter is going to talk about much more in just a few moments. But first, let's welcome our guest for today's event and find out a bit more about him. Dr. Ethan Setembre is Vice President and Head of Research at Securius, which is one of the world's largest influenza vaccine producers. Now, Ethan leads the R&D team responsible for developing vaccines against infectious diseases with a specific focus on influenza, where they utilize new innovative approaches to RNA vaccines, cell-based manufacturing methods, adjuvants, and protein-based antigens. Ethan is a veteran of the life sciences industry where he has continued to develop his strong background in structural vaccinology and vaccine development. And today he'll introduce us to the intricacies of SARNA and how it elicits immune responses. Additionally, Ethan will describe the differences between SARNA versus mRNA and how SARNA can be applied to generate influenza and COVID-19 vaccines and why it may represent the future of RNA therapeutic development. I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for providing me this opportunity to share with you the story of Securis' self-amplifying mRNA platform. My name is Ethan Setembri. I'm the head of research at Securis. I also am in the fortunate position to work with a team of smart, creative, dedicated researcher, researchers focusing on generating new vaccines. Um, to that end, the stories I'll tell you today are from data that they've generated and continue to generate. Let's begin by looking at what we're gonna talk about today. So overall, I'm gonna start by telling you about the self-amplifying mRNA technology. Then I'm going to go into two stories where I'm going to talk about the benefits of the platform and data that we've generated to date. First story will be around SARS-CoV-2 and the self-amplifying mRNA vaccines we've made against that. And I'll end with the influenza self-amplifying mRNA vaccine story. I'll tell you a bit around what we've generated so far, and I'll share some data around that particular uh, target. So first, let's begin by looking back. Always a good thing to do. We look back, um, self-amplifying mRNA was actually worked on even more historically than this. However, um, we began work uh, at a predecessor company of Securus, Novartis Vaccines and Diagnostics, starting in around 2008, at which time that team worked on a number of different targets as you can see, working with a number of different partners through time. And in fact, even work with flu began in 2013, actually a little bit before, with H7N9 vaccine made in eight days from getting the sequence online. This was with the combination of work with GISID as well. Securus began around 2015, where we continued flu vaccine development we are largely a flu company, have a number of flu vaccines in the market. 
and we focus on flu vaccines development. So in 2015, we continued with work on self-amplifying mRNA uh, vaccines, generating also H5N1 candidate and ultimately a seasonal flu vaccine as well, containing four different strains as in the current vaccines. We then generated a COVID vaccine, um, which I'm going to talk about today. And uh, even as uh, late as 2021, uh, we've been working on an H2 pre-pandemic vaccine in collaboration with the U.S. government, focused not only on self-amplifying mRNA, but also on our unique cell culture platform. Now we have a current vaccine called FluCellVax, which we use to generate pre-pandemic vaccines as well. And this is important because it allows us to compare the different types of platforms and understand each of them better. So let's talk a little bit about the self-amplifying mRNA vaccine. So right here, um, I show actually a version that's bisistronic, and I'll explain what that means. But essentially, these are the key elements of the RNA for the self-amplifying mRNA vaccine. Starting on the left side at the five prime end, we have a five prime cap. This vaccine or this platform is based on VEE uh, virus or Venezuelan equine encephalitis alpha virus. From that, we've taken four of the non-structural proteins that encode for the viral replicon or the part of the virus that allows it to initially copy the RNA and ultimately have an expansion of the amount of RNA within a cell. We've taken this largely from the TC83 version of the Venezuelan equine encephalitis alpha virus, uh, which has a long history of clinical use as it's a live attenuated vaccine strain. This includes what we uh, took from that are some attenuating mutations in these particular areas um, that we are now present in the self-amplifying mRNA platform. So that's on the left side. In place of the structural proteins that are normally in the alpha virus, so for instance, we've completely deleted E1, E2, and C, um, we've instead put in genes of interest. Now, uh, at the moment, I'm showing here a bisistronic construct, so that's why there's GOI1, or gene of interest 1, and gene of interest 2. In between them is, sub, uh, is a subgenomic promoter, and this enables the production of both the first and second gene. And completing the RNA is a three prime UTR, and then ultimately a poly A tail. Now, as you can tell, um, although it's based on the Venezuelan equine encephalitis alpha virus, we've removed all the relevant structural genes from that virus. And therefore, this RNA is incapable of producing virus. And that's important because it's really used as a basic design that allows amplification of the response, which I'll go into a little bit later on. Uh, this is the RNA. However, to generate a uh, self-amplifying mRNA vaccine, we also formulate this. And in that particular case, as no doubt many on this call know that uh, for most mRNA vaccines, and in particular for the self-amplifying mRNA vaccine that we use, we have an LNP delivery system or a lipid nanoparticle delivery system. So on the left side is just an image of what the various layers in this LNP structure uh, looks like. On the outside, um, we have, well, all throughout, there are four main uh, lipids. Let's start with the first lipid, and that's shown there in blue, the ionizable cationic lipid. Uh, the purpose of this lipid is to bind and protect the RNA. So surround it, protect it. It also facilitates endosomal escape. So in a large way, it's the business end of the LNP that helps protect, but also allows for the endosomal escape into the cell, which is an important part of the functioning of this particular system. Uh, in addition, there's cholesterol. This is also important for a variety of different aspects. Uh, a helper lipid, DSPC, and finally, a stabilizing lipid, lipid which contains PEG-2000. Overall, this is the intended to both stabilize the particle, prevent interactions of, of particles. Overall, uh, it's approximately 100 nanometers uh, in diameter and forms this shell, which ultimately protects the, in our case, self-amplifying mRNA and allows for delivery into the cell. 
So this is one of those key elements that's essential for delivery into, into the cell and then ultimately the, the production of the self-amplifying mRNA. So to give you an example of uh, the two main technologies that are being used for mRNA currently, uh, they're shown here. The top uh, path, the top picture shows conventional RNA vaccine. So what's that? So the conventional RNA vaccine are a lot like the vaccines that are out currently for COVID-19. In this case, uh, there's RNA inside this lipid shell, this LNP delivery system that I described on the last slide. And there's an antigen coding sequence in red. This codes for your gene of interest. In this case of SARS-CoV-2, it is the S protein. In the case of influenza, it could be hemagglutinin, it could be neuraminidase, and I'll talk about that a little later on. As this gets into the cell, thanks to this LNP delivery system, the RNA is released into the cell. Then the cellular machinery recognizes RNA is there, and it makes viral antigens protein from this RNA. So you get this generation of viral antigens, which ultimately are presented to the immune system, and you raise an immune response. So how is that different than the self-amplifying RNA vaccine? Well, if you take a look at the bottom, in this panel, you can also see the red gene of interest. This is your antigen coding sequence, the same as above. However, there's an additional uh, set of genes. I described them on the last slide, and this is the replicase or the replicon, and that's shown in blue. That represents the NSPs on the previous slide. In the same way that the LNP delivers the RNA in conventional RNA into the cell, so too does it deliver the self-amplifying RNA into the cell. Now comes the main difference. Here, the RNA produces the replicase from those blue genes as one of the first steps, and that allows for a copying of the RNA. So you get many more copies of the original RNA as well as the gene of interest, uh, RNA containing the gene of interest, and each of those copies generates the viral antigen. So you can see, rather than just having a single step where a single RNA generates a number of viral antigens, you have a single RNA generating other RNAs, which then go on to each create these viral antigens. So as you could imagine, this is where you get what they call the amplification or the amplification of this response. Ultimately, again, the viral antigens are then presented to the cell in a variety of different ways to raise various responses, which we'll go into. And then ultimately, you uh, get your immune response against your antigen of interest. So let me show you how that works. And we have some data to talk, talk about how that works. So here, we did an experiment uh, generating self-amplifying mRNA, which I show there at the top. And here, there's only one gene, and that gene of interest is the luciferase gene. Luciferase, as you know, can be produced inside, in vivo, inside of an animal. And it can, uh, with the proper treatment, you can measure the amount of luciferase that's present. It helps you track where it is in the body. It helps you uh, see the relative amounts of uh, luciferase that's been generated in the particular cells that you're, you're focusing in on. Now, we generated both a self-amplifying version of this, as well as a non-amplifying or conventional RNA version of this. And just by way of example, um, the experiments shown at the bottom, we have bulb C mice, which we immunize with either of these particular, uh, um, particular vaccines, or in our case, it's just expression of luciferase um, in the intramuscularly in the hind limb. And on the right side, this is just a, a represented image of what that looks like when you look at the luciferase. And you can see, um, and I won't go into this too much more, but the uh, luciferase stays in the area in which it was put, even over the number of days, for the self-amplifying mRNA, we don't see it anywhere else except for localized in that particular area. Uh, and again, we look at uh, the imaging over 21 days and we have uh, shots and we measure the ultimate, the, the luciferase response over that period of time. So what did it look like? So we take a look at the next slide. Here, this is again, as I mentioned before, this is showing the in vivo protein expression or the amount of luciferase. On the left side, on the y-axis, this is the whole body radiance, so essentially looking at the amount of luciferase that's present. And on the bottom, this is the days post-vaccination. And charted on there, and just uh, remember to look at the left side, it's a log scale, so 
It's a significant increase when it, uh, when it goes up in a meaningful manner. I'm showing the response, the uh, luciferase uh, generated by self-amplifying mRNA in pink. And in black, I'm showing the luciferase mRNA uh, that generated the response. So as we look at these two, you can see that both the mRNA and self-amplifying mRNA have similar amounts of protein generated initially. And then if we look at the mRNA in black, it drops over a period of time and slowly drops off. And that's the luciferase uh, no longer present in the animal. On the other hand, if we look at the self-amplifying mRNA in uh, the pink color, it in fact goes up over seven days where it reaches its peak and then comes down with a similar, uh, with a similar decrease over time. Um, if you compare to say, well, what's the difference? How much different, how much protein was expressed in one case rather than the other? We see that there's approximately a hundredfold more protein being generated by self-amplifying mRNA, or I should say signal being generated by self-amplifying mRNA, which we believe relates back to protein compared to mRNA. So that's what I described before, the amplification process. And this demonstrates that the amplification process really does result in that increase in the amount of uh, luciferase being generated. Since these were both done at the same amount of RNA, it really does represent a significant difference for the same amount of RNA that's present. Um, in addition, this is the driver for the potential that the RNA itself, the self-amplifying mRNA, RNA, may have a lower dose. And that's some one of the benefits that we could potentially have from these self-amplifying mRNA platform. If I take a look at the next slide, this highlights some of those potential commonalities and also some of the benefits of the self-amplifying mRNA. So on the left side, there are a number of common traits for RNA vaccines. Um, we can see high level of efficacy that's consistent when we compare the two systems. They're obviously both quite fast since they uh, the ability to generate uh, new uh, vaccines or new self-amplifying mRNA or RNA constructs can be relatively fast as it's based largely on just the gene of interest. The potential footprint for manufacturing can be smaller. Uh, however, we do have to consider that there will be a similar level of fill finish capacity as long as you need to fill finish and using the traditional systems that we have currently you'll still have to use those traditional uh, larger systems. And therefore, although your drug substance and even your drug product can be small, fill and finish will have to be larger. But there are these challenges that uh, all of the systems face currently. That is around stability and, and how long they can be at 4C, for instance, uh, the presentation, and uh, ultimately the potential side effects of these sorts of systems, which seem at times larger than one might expect from a protein-based vaccine rather than an RNA-based vaccine. However, that exact issue around side effects is one of the benefits that we believe we might find from the self-amplifying mRNA platform. Here, as we just described on the previous slide, the amplification allows for the potential to have a lower dose, and that lower dose may indeed drive uh, less reactogenic vaccine. Uh, the self-amplifying mRNA vaccine, as I'll show, has robust CD8 responses, more so even than RNA vaccines and protein-based vaccines. And then ultimately for all of these systems, um, you can have approved vaccines with conserved genes, but if you want to put multiple conserved genes in the same uh, vaccine or in the same RNA, uh, it may be easier to do in the context of self-amplifying mRNA where the doses can still be lower. So, Ultimately, when I think about generating uh, vaccines and when I think about vaccine responses, think about the immune system and the response I'm really looking for. And this really depends on what's the best protective mechanism based on whatever your target is. And in general, in broad strokes, there are two main parts of the immune system uh, that's stimulated. So first, the B cell response or the T cell response. These are the two main responses that uh, build your response against a particular antigen and ultimately against a particular pathogen. For B cell antibody response, most uh, vaccines, certainly most protein-based vaccines, focus really on serum antibodies. So this is serum IgG. This is to protect, in the case of respiratory viruses, to protect your lungs. 
uh, and ultimately, hopefully, lead to some degree of sterilizing immunity. Um, that is a very useful response. That is the response that is the basis of uh, many of the vaccines that we have, particularly the protein-based vaccines. There are also mucosal antibodies, and I think for most protein vaccines, this is not something that's raised. So this is something that uh, could uh, we could really benefit from raising these responses even more. On the T cell side, when we're thinking about protein-based vaccines, you tend not to raise CD8 responses or, or robust CD4 responses. You do raise some CD4 responses because CD4 is the T helper cells that increase the B cell response. And by adding adjuvants to protein-based vaccines, you can actually increase the CD4 responses, which ultimately benefits your serum IgG. However, you tend not to get these CD8 responses. And these cytolytic T cell responses or CD8 uh, T cells are important and an important layer of protection that is not traditional for many of the protein-based vaccines. And these can ultimately result in a reduced severity of infection and allow for greater cross-strain reacti uh, reactivity, particularly if you target conserved T-cell epitopes or conserved proteins that contain uh, conserved T-cell epitopes. And if you can raise those responses, it could be uh, cross-strain reactivity could increase. And this represents really a, a new protective layer that some other types of systems have, but we certainly find in RNA vaccines and self-amplifying RNA vaccines in particular, you do see that pretty strongly. So let me tell you a little about, bit about, and I'm gonna show you each of these aspects um, as I talk about various vaccines that we've generated against SARS-CoV-2 and against influenza. But first, let's talk about SARS-CoV-2. So here uh, is a slide that talks a little bit about the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, on the left side, this is just a, a, a schematic of a COVID-19 uh, COVID or SARS-CoV-2. Um, in this case, you can see the spike protein or the S protein is on the outside. The S protein is largely the protein that vaccines currently are focused on. However, there's another ubiquitous protein, a nucleocapsid protein, not on the surface, however, uh, one, if one raises a response against that, it may indeed be protective. There's also a, a membrane and an enveloped uh, protein as well. But we focused on the spike protein and the nucleocapsid protein. And at the top of the slide, you can see a, a monocystronic SAMRNA expressing the S protein. That was one construct we looked at. And then we also looked at another uh, construct containing both the S and the N protein in a bisystronic setup as described originally and as the second uh, uh, self-amplifying mRNA construct shown there. If you look in uh, panel B, essentially what you see there is uh, sorting of cells that have uh, been, at, that have self-amplifying mRNA expressing the S protein. And here you can see through flow cytometry, if we look across the bottom, we're, we're looking for S-containing proteins and if you go up the y-axis, we're looking for N-containing proteins. So when we just express S, no surprise, we see S protein and cells expressing S protein showing up. On the other hand, when we express S and N, and particularly because this is a bisystronic system, cells will contain and have to contain both the S and N if they get the self-amplifying mRNA. So you will see both. Uh, we confirmed that. You can see that in the flow. We confirmed that in the Western. Again, we show that when there's an S protein present, you see the S protein. And when there's the S and N present, you also see the addition of the N showing up as well. So both of these have value. And in particular for the N protein, likely the value will come through CD8 cells because it's, a, it's an interior nucleocapsid protein. So again, we looked at both of these, we generated these vaccines, and we immunized uh, mice with mice and hamsters, both of which I'm going to show, uh, with these, these particular vaccines. So let's look at the first one and let's look at the T cell responses. So here we looked specifically at both the CD8 T cell responses and the CD4 T, T cell responses in the SARS-CoV-2 S SAMRNA. We immunized animals with one microgram or 0 0.01 microgram of the uh, vaccine and we looked at the responses. In the red, I show the responses to um, that construct. And so as you can see, if we look over on the left side, this is the CD8 responses. Um, we see about 12%, a little under 12% of cells 
um, CD8 T cells expressing uh, antigen specific responses against the S protein. And at the 0 0.01 microgram dose, it's a little bit above four. On the opposite side, I show the CD4 responses, and this is CD4 responses against, uh, again, against S. And here with one microgram or 0 0.01 microgram shown in red, uh, we see some fairly robust responses. I compare that, uh, although at the time we didn't generate our own mRNA vaccine, we did run this uh, experiment precisely as Corbett et al. had run this from their, uh, as shown in their nature paper. And here, if we take a look on the left side in blue, uh, one microgram uh, dose of the mRNA vaccine expressing the S protein uh, generated about one, a little over 1% of CD8 specific T cells, um, and they weren't visible at 0 0.01 micrograms. And on the right side, for the CD4 T cells, again, it was a low response for one microgram at 0 0.01. So overall, what we saw, at least by comparing these uh, in this particular comparative uh, view, we saw fairly robust CD8 T cell responses and CD4 responses for SAMRNA and somewhat less robust responses, although still present for mRNA. Uh, but this is a reason to believe that the self-amplifying mRNA may provide some additional benefit. And likely it's due to the process of the self-amplification um, that raises these uh, even more robust responses with the same amount of RNA. Uh, then the question might be, well, what about the neutralizing antibody titers? What did you see there? So here uh, we used, this was using the original virus uh, target S. And so uh, here shown below, um, we, we immunized mice in a two dose regimen, uh, prime boost uh, as you'd expect. Um, the one dose, in one case, we started with just SAMRNA alone as the first dose and then a PBS uh, as a second dose. So we could just look at the single dose response versus a two dose regimen. Uh, where we did self-epifying mRNA against S for both the beginning of the first and the second uh, immunization. And we did this not just for the targeting the S protein, but we also used the SN construct here as well. The S construct shown in blue at the bottom and the SN construct is shown in red. And we had convalescent zero, which we show in green. Uh, so as we look at the bottom and we look at the micronutralization titer, generated against these proteins. Uh, what we see is the self-amplifying mRNA again, uh, response against the S protein. On the first dose, you raise a response which is similar to convalescent sera, and then the second dose boosts it above that. Uh, that's the same situation for the SN, so shown in red, you see a boost uh, upon the second dose that brings it above the convalescent sera. And then if we look over at the right side, looking specifically for the inhibition of ACE2 binding titer, so essentially blocking the S protein from binding to its cognate receptor, uh, this again shows a boost of that response upon the second dose. So first dose, you see a, a robust response and a second dose, it, it increases. Um, if we take a look at the responses now, uh, looking, sort of parsing the responses a little bit more but against CD, for CD4 and CD8 against the spike protein, here, uh, we had two pools of peptides, one for S1, so sort of for the, the front part, the beginning part, uh, the N-terminal part of the uh, S protein, or the C-terminal part shown in S2. Um, these are the results that we saw. We also looked for responses to the N protein in the case where we had an SN, um, uh, an SN vaccine. So taking a look, starting in the top left, CD4 cells, Indeed, we do see responses to the one microgram and even 0 0.01 microgram of any of the uh, of any of the vaccines. Uh, however, you do see you tend to see a drop, particularly with the S alone construct. You see a drop going to 0 0.01 micrograms. Uh, on the right side of each panel, we have the adjuvanted protein S vaccine that we used as a comparator. Uh, overall, what you can see from the CD4 responses either to S1 or S2 is you have uh, you do have responses to the S1 and S2 regions for the CD4. Uh, they are the TH1 phenotype. And in the case where we look for CD4 T cells against N, as you'd expect, we only see those N responses when we have the N present 
either at one microgram or 0 0.01 microgram. So you can see them in both situations there at the bottom. In panel B and D, where we look at the CD8 T cell responses, here again, uh, we look for the top one is the S1 specific responses. You can see quite robust uh, CD8 uh, T cells against the S, uh, S1 region for all of, the, all of the vaccines tested. Obviously, we don't see it for the adjuvanted protein vaccine. As I described before, you do not tend to raise CD8 responses for protein-based vaccines. And we used an adjuvant that didn't purposely raise CD8 responses. And in panel D, again, looking at S2, here again, we see those robust S responses. Um, more so at one microgram and less so at 0 0.01 microgram. So overall, what this said was, yes, even in a bisestronic context, you can see both CD4 and CD8 responses to, to the components. And for N, we saw the CD4 responses. We didn't look for the CD8 responses for a variety of reasons. Now, we also looked at uh, to determine whether or not this response was protective. Um, and we're going to, I, I show that here, where we did a uh, hamster challenge model. And the challenge is described above, again, a two-dose regimen, uh, followed by a challenge at day 50 and euthanasia at day 54. Uh, initially, we looked at the sera. Here, we used a three microgram dose or a 0.3 microgram dose of, of uh, RNA using self, our self-amplifying mRNA in blue. Uh, expressing S, in red, expressing S and N, and in green is the adjuvanted protein S. So these are the three vaccines that were used at various levels. Uh, what you can see in the, the panel B is that we looked against the responses, micronutriters against the, either the original virus on the left side, the beta variant in the middle, and the delta variant on the right side of panel B. And when we look at those responses, what you can see is that overall, you can raise uh, neutralizing titers against each of these viruses, even though we Im immunize only with the original virus. So we saw it against all three. There is some decrease in the overall response as you get to the Delta variant. However, when what might be interesting is both the, when you use the red, the S and N vaccine, it was higher than when you looked at the S alone vaccine when you compare against the Delta variant neutralization. So this may suggest that the N has some additional benefit in protection, or at least in the, in the micronutrialization, as we see these responses. When we look at the day four results from the hamster challenge model, and we're now looking for virus either in the lung or in the nasal terminates, what we see for C that um, in all of the vaccines, including the adjuvanted protein S vaccine, you do see no titers in the lung. And this is opposite. Uh, this is if you compare against PBS, and that's shown in gray. Um, you can see high titers of the of the virus in the lung with the PBS control, and you don't see them in the other uh, in the other cases. On the other hand, if you look at the nasal turbinates, again, PBS uh, shows high nasal nasal turbinates as you expect. There was no protection when you used a control. On the other hand, in blue, using SA mRNA against S. Uh, it drastically reduced about 10, uh, 10 to the fourth fold the titer of virus in the nasal turbinates. And similarly with the S and N, although slightly higher, you did see a significant drop in those titers as well as in the nasal turbinates. As always, the drop in the nasal turbinates is really important because that's what most likely links to transmission. So the more, the lower that is, the better off you are. So let's take a look at the influenza SAMRNA vaccines. And here, I just want to highlight that there are some differences, right? Flu is not COVID, COVID is not flu. And that's important, uh, particularly when you're thinking about how you're going to design your vaccine. So for SARS-CoV-2, there's a single circulating virus. Of course, there's many flavors of it now, and we have to really understand if they are really antigenically different flavors, um, whether or not they'll meaningfully change due to uh, pressures that allow antigenic drift or not. And at least historically, there was no pre-existing immunity. Now that we're getting pre-existing immunity, we're going to see how that starts changing, how SARS-CoV-2 changes over time. Um, for both flu and COVID, you have a waning immune system or a developing immune system. That's where you have some of the biggest issues at the two ends of the age spectrum. And that becomes a real challenge. For flu, however, 
Remember, there are four influenza subtypes that co-circulate. Uh, now, we, then we might say that there are three with B. yamagata being um, nearly non-existent. Um, however, these are co-circulating and they are very antigenically different. On top of that, depending on the strain, you see even more antigenic drift. And I'm going to explain a little bit of why we see that. And of course, you're dealing with pre-existing immunity. In many cases, a lifetime of pre-existing immunity from either exposure to the virus or exposure to the vaccine. So flu is fairly complicated. It has these various other layers to it, including, and importantly, pre-existing immunity that has an effect on your response to the next vaccine or your response to the next infection. So it's very, very important that when you're designing a vaccine, you think about that. And this is important. Um, this is just an example for H3N2. Uh, when we look at years where there were H3N2 mismatches, but overall, we, we simply look at uh, visits for ILI in the United States uh, over the time period of the year, and that's the week number shown on the bottom, uh, with one being January. So that sort of tells you the beginning of the year. And as you'd expect in the Northern Hemisphere, you tend to see during those winter months, these spikes of ILI. And uh, overall, in seasons where there were particular mismatch or in season where there was the uh, 2009 H1 pandemic shown there in the yellow line, you see these significant spikes and then they go down. But this happens every year. And this happens every year for a variety of reasons, including the constant change of the virus as it evades the immune systems of people around the world. Now that's just in the context of seasonal flu, which continues to be a challenge even with vaccines on the market. However, influenza poses a constant pandemic threat. And obviously we're dealing with the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic currently, but historically uh, we have seen a number four, uh, specifically in, in the 1900s and, uh, and, uh, and now, we've seen these different pandemics and using different viruses. H1N1 is Spanish flu, in 1918, H2N2 in 1957, H3N2 in 1968, and then effectively a reemergence in some sense of the H1N1 uh, virus from 1918 now in 2009. And we wait. That really, when you think about influenza, and particularly influenza pandemics, you have to realize it's not if the next pandemic will come, but when it will come. And in fact, for, for me, I thought that this, uh, this may be the pandemic decade, not because of SARS-CoV-2, but because I expect there to be um, an influenza pandemic. So therefore it's really essential that we are well prepared to handle an influenza pandemic if it were to occur. Um, as we look at why, why does this virus change? Why is this a particular challenge? Uh, we look here on the left side, you see the virus, an image of the virus, and there are three main proteins on the surface, but normally we focus on two, and really we focus on one. That one is hemagglutinin. Um, that is one of the main determinants of antigenicity. Neuraminidase is also a player on the surface, but not given usually as much oxygen when we think about vaccine targets. And also there's M2 on the surface as well, some proteins on the inside. If we look on the right side, this is, a, this is the ectodomain of hemagglutinin, and the bottom is where the cellular membrane would be or the viral membrane would be, and the top is reaching out away from the viral surface, uh, looking for and searching for a cell to bind and a receptor to bind. Uh, hence, that's why the receptor binding site is all the way there at the top. That's where it tends to bind. Uh, that's where it binds. That's where the receptor binding site is. That's where it binds the cell, and ultimately that allows for entry into the cell for the virus. This region that contains the receptor binding site also is the dominant antigenic region. It is prone to adaptation. So over time, when, you, when humans raise responses, it tends to raise responses to these regions at the top, and these regions at the tops then change, and that allows for antigenic change. So this is really a key part when we think about how can we make a, a, a better or how can we make an influenza vaccine. Shown here, just is this. These are two self-amplifying mRNA flu vaccines that we generated. First, on top, we generated a monoshistronic version using HA, and then on the bottom, we generated a HANA bisistronic uh, SAMRNA influenza vaccine. Uh, one of the important elements about bisistronic constructs is you can uh, you can determine exactly 
how you want to balance out that response and generate the amount of gene of interest one versus gene of interest two. And you can control that depending on what, in this case, subgenomic promoters are used, but can be done in other ways. So on this slide, I'm going to show you the responses that we generated against flu vaccines uh, generated on self-amplifying mRNA platform containing just the HA alone, so just the hemagglutin alone. So in this case, we immunized Bob C. mice uh, two weeks, of, uh, three weeks apart, um, and we tested three weeks post the second dose. And we looked here in particular for the HAI titers or hemagglutination inhibition titers, essentially an assay that uh, determines the antibodies that have been raised that block the binding of HA to its cognate receptor. And we compared a 1.4 microgram dose of either the monovalent SA mRNA vaccine using the HA from either H1, H3, B Victoria, or B Yamagata, the cell culture version, uh, or against the quadrivalent form. So 1.4 micrograms of each. So we combined all four of them together and we compared this against an adjuvanted quadrivalent influenza uh, vaccine, protein based vaccine. In this case, it was an MF59 adjuvanted protein vaccine. So looking at the titers, these are three weeks post second dose titers. What you can see starting over on the left side in red is that all of the responses, uh, all of the vaccines raised robust HAI responses. And in particular, if we look at the self-amplifying mRNA alone, all the way on the left side, the quadrivalent version of self-amplifying mRNA, the solid bar in the middle, or the checkered bar of AQIVC, they're pretty similar overall. There's some drop uh, of numerically of the quadrivalent version. So when in the quadrivalent setting, there's a slight drop in that response. Still not sure if that has to do more specifically with this, this particular animal model or other animal models, but we do sometimes see that. Um, that's the same case as you look across the board. There is some drop on the uh, on when, when combining in the quadrivalent form. However, the self-amplifying mRNA essentially is similar to the adjuvant quadrivalent influenza vaccine, adjuvant quadrivalent influenza vaccine. And we choose that on purpose. We choose the MF59 adjuvant, adjuvant, which raises really a robust response in, in animals and in humans. We use that so that we can compare against something which is a very, very robust vaccine. So here, again, quadrivalent setup, we see those responses across the board, even when they're all together, all four strains are together. Now, looking at the slightly different construct and looking at the responses, here we generated an H5N1 uh, vaccine, and this is a bisestronic self-amplifying mRNA vaccine co containing the hemoglobin of H5 and the neuraminidase of the H5N1 that we chose. And on the left side, I'll show you the micronutrition titers, and on the right side, the NAI uh, in the ELA titer. So in other words, the neuraminidase responses, you can tease out when you, you specifically look on the right side. So on the left side, in order from blue, this is the H5N1 bisestronic vaccine versus H5 alone or N1 alone. And as you can see, in the long form MN, you could see the titers for, uh, for all three vaccines are fairly high with some difference between H5 alone and either the H5N1 vaccine or the N1 vaccine. And similarly, uh, if we look against H1N1, actually you do see some difference. And here, those uh, vaccines that contain neuraminidase, which remember is not the same neuraminidase that's in H1N1, it's a different neuraminidase, and yet it's highly conserved. And so you can see some cross-reactivity and that cross-reactivity in microneutralization is largely likely driven by the neuraminidase. Uh, and that's interesting because as we're thinking about making uh, vaccines that contain broader responses against influenza that can deal with that antigenic drift, it demonstrates that there is a value to neuraminidase and understanding how to optimize that and raise that response can be uh, quite important in generating even better vaccines. On the right side, as you'd expect, any vaccine that contains neuraminidase raises NAI titers against H5N1 with the matched N1, you can see those titers are very high. And again, when compared against H1N1, looking for the NAI titer, you do see those N1 uh, responses raised uh, in the vaccines that contain N1 as well. So this suggests that the neuraminidase 
not only is an important component and can you can raise responses to both HA and NA in a bisistron construct, but those NA responses are important and generate a broader response. So this is very important as we think about the development of future flu vaccines and perhaps how flu, in, uh, flu vaccines using self-amplifying mRNA may, different, may differ from those COVID vaccines that have been generated with RNA. So finally, and just to sum up for what I uh, told you today, I've told you about how the self-amplifying mRNA platform is highly versatile and can be used for generating a variety of different vaccines. We then looked at those responses against each of the vaccines, and I demonstrated that there were robust B cell as well as T cell responses. In particular, CD8 responses are important to highlight because that adds another layer of protection that's different than the current vaccines, as certainly many of the current protein vaccines that are being used. Uh, Multi-cystronic SAM mRNA vaccines can generate responses to each of the antigens. You can actually tune them up or down depending on uh, what you use for your subgenomic promoter or other ways that you can tune them up and down. And they really enable co-expression in a single cell. So if you're trying to generate a con uh, complex of some sort, this, in this assures that those proteins will be generated in a single cell and perhaps that uh, whatever com complex would have a chance to form. And finally, influenza poses a different challenge than SARS-CoV-2. This is important as we think about how to develop influenza vaccines and learn from the SARS-CoV-2 experience to generate those better and better vaccines. So with that, I wanna thank you for your attention. I wanna thank the organizers once again. And of course, as the head of research, I wanna thank my really dedicated team that has focused so hard on generating the platform, developing these vaccines, and work every day to make vaccines that are better and better. Thank you. And with that, we've come to the end of our webinar. So I'd like to remind everyone that the webinar will be archived on the GEN website for up to a year. So if you missed any parts of it, you can watch it again, or feel free to forward the link to any of your friends and colleagues, which we always recommend. That's at www.genengnews.com. I'd like to thank Ethan again for his extremely informative presentation. And I'd like to thank you, the audience, for your attention and for all of your thoughtful and so many questions. And very special thanks to Precision Nanosystems for sponsoring this webinar. Hopefully we'll see you again at another Gen Webinar in the near future. Goodbye for now. Everyone stay safe and healthy.